Good morning. Hard to believe, but it's been a month now since we picked up our 2022 Long Range Model Y, and I thought I'd give you all an update. In this video, I'll cover the things we love, what we've learned, pleasant surprises, disappointments, current concerns, and finally close out by suggesting some improvements. Maybe if this video can get enough traction, it will cross Tesla's radar and they'll consider them. Oh yeah, and I'll be giving away some Model Y mudguards too. So let's jump right in. When I was younger, I was really into flying. In fact, my wife and I got married flying around Mount Rainier one beautiful Saturday morning in an airplane I built. I really had no interest in cars. Driving was just as a necessary process to get from A to B. As I was hoping it would, our Tesla has changed all that. I love to drive this car. Where normally I would put a couple hundred miles a month driving before, in this first month we've put well over 2,000 miles on this car. I look forward to driving it every day. This car is so much quieter than anything else I've owned. It's amazing and more relaxing than you can imagine. I found myself asking my wife not to put ice cubes in her glass of water as the clinking of the ice against the glass while we were driving was annoying me. In addition, the pushback dash and the big front window make the car feel so airy, spacious, and relaxing. Some don't fancy the minimalist look, but I love it. We also love the glass roof. It's just spectacular and adds a whole other level of enjoyment to driving, especially for the backseat passengers. The sound system is amazing. I get mocked routinely for going out to sit in the car just to listen to music, but it's the best sound system I have and the best one I've ever owned. And because the car is so quiet while driving, you can enjoy the sound quality at any speed. I know it sounds a bit silly, but I love charging at home. Every time I plug in that charger, I grin a little bit. I absolutely love having a full tank every time I go out. I suspect that because the vast majority of my charging is done at home, that over the long haul, I will spend much less time charging than I would have diverting to and filling up at gas stations. I also get a huge kick out of watching the green bar appear on the display, indicating that the battery is being regenerated. I remember as a kid, I would contemplate ideas for regen braking while doing my paper out. Yes, paper out, look it up. It's a kick these many years later to watch the Tesla recover energy that our other vehicles would just be throwing away. We also love showing Tesla to others. To watch others come to share our excitement is always a lot of fun. The instant acceleration is not only amazing, it's crazy fun. You can punch it at 60 and instantly get pushed back in your seat, just as much as you would from a dead stop, maybe more. I actually plan on exploring G-loads at different speeds in another video. Flooring the pedal always brings a grin or giggle to the passengers, which is why I call it the giggle pedal, a term my kids have discouraged me from using. One caution though, you might want to warn passengers that you're going to floor it. I surprised my daughter on her first ride and because she had a hair bun, the acceleration actually bruised her head. And the sentry mode videos are often a kick to watch, although sometimes a bit scary. We needed to learn the obvious things like how to open the doors correctly and that the switch on the charger is a mechanical switch, not a touch switch, and how to close the front correctly. Put your palms on either side of the T and press firmly. While visiting my son, I learned that charging overnight outside in the pouring Seattle rain isn't an issue. I was more than slightly concerned as water and high voltage generally don't get along well but it turned out to be a total non-issue. Getting used to regen braking is also a learning process, but easily mastered. Really, easily. I'm still learning how to keep autopilot happy with the least amount of thought. It needs to feel a bit of resistance every 30 seconds or it will yeah. nag you to provide some. Yeah, like if you don't, it will beat you out for the rest of the drive, as it should. If you watched our pickup day video, you saw that it did just that to me on my first drive. 
I found that generally, if I keep my hands on the top half of the wheel or palms down on the bottom of the wheel, the weight of my arms will usually keep autopilot happy, except for long straight stretches where I'll need to remember to provide a little resistance. Autopilot is good about reminding you though, and my brain seems to naturally respond to the warning at the top of the screen that flashes blue when it's trying to tell me, hey idiot, put your hands back on the wheel. Thanks to Sawyer Merritt, I learned that, unlike what the manual says, there actually is a backdoor manual release. I have a video showing how you can actually make it useful for less than five bucks. Speaking of manual releases, I've also learned that it's useful to show new passengers the door open button, as often their first instinct is to pull the manual release, something you really don't want to make a habit of. Silly, I know, but one day we forgot how to use the key fob to open the frunk and the trunk. So we forced our old brains to remember that those functions need a double click to work. Before we got our car, I'd heard that the auto wipers and auto high beam functions weren't very good. They work fine for us, although sometimes the wipers are slower to start up than I would like, in which case I just quickly press in the button on the left stock to initiate the process. Sometimes the high beam function will get confused by bright lights that aren't cars, but generally both functions work much better than I was expecting. And if you want easier access to the manual controls, just put the wipers on your shortcut menu. Some have complained about how stiff the ride is, but we've found that with our 19 inch Gemini wheels, it's smoother than any other car we've owned. The lack of noise and vibration also contributes to the smoothness. It's not only a joy to drive, it's a joy to ride in. Based on many online comments, I was also worried about the build quality, but our car was perfect. Maybe I'm just not picky, but the only so-called fault I could find is that compared to other doors, which close by themselves once you push past the keep open indent, the driver door sometimes requires a bit of a nudge. It's ridiculously minor and only an issue because the other doors close so effortlessly. I've had several people think they were auto close. Although we got 3D Max Piter mats before we actually picked up the car, the supply mats are turned out to be nicer than expected and show the dirt less. We may actually use them during the summer and only put the Max Piters in during the more wet seasons. I'm not sure why, but I was a bit nervous about supercharging, but the process couldn't have been more painless. We've only taken one trip where supercharging was needed, but we planned it around lunch and it didn't feel like an inconvenience at all. And it couldn't have been easier. It's just the Tesla experience. When you're looking to buy a Tesla, you pay a lot of attention to range and acceleration. But one of my biggest surprises was how efficient this car is. I knew my energy costs would be less because it's an electric car, but frankly, it's amazing. The other day, my wife and I took a 130 mile round trip just to take a drive and to share a milkshake. The energy cost to push our two ton car 130 miles was less than half the price of the milkshake. It's amazing. I never consider the cost to make trips into town anymore. With gas prices what they are and electricity at seven cents per kilowatt hour, our energy costs are less than one tenth per mile what they would be if we drove our crossover ICE car instead. It's insane. I was also pleased to find that our car has built-in CCS support, so we'll be able to use CCS chargers once Tesla starts selling the adapters in the United States. We have a Buick Rendezvous that projects the speed and other info onto the windshield, a heads-up display, if you will. I was convinced I'd miss this while driving the Tesla, but I don't at all. The speed is very easy to see, and your brain picks up on its location almost instantly. I know there are folks that swear by the instrument cluster display on the Model S and X, and there are a number of companies that sell very cool retrofits for the Model 3 and Y too. I thought I'd want one, but it turns out I really don't see the need. Although I'd heard rumors that those in the northern climates were getting free mudguards and PPF protection in front of the rear wheel. I wasn't sure if we were one of those select markets. I was pleasantly surprised to find we were. I bought some front mud guards in advance that I no longer need, so if you'd like them, just subscribe and put mud guards in the comments. Two weeks after this video is released, I'll randomly pick from those who responded and 
send them guards for free. Finally, I was surprised to find that camp mode was comfortable even for my 6 foot 4 inch frame. Not finding a mattress with all the features I wanted, I ordered a normal firm foam mattress the other day that I hope to modify to my needs. I'll probably make a video of the process. I do have to say I tested it by myself and not with my wife. After 37 years of marriage, a California king is almost not big enough, so I'm not sure I can convince her to try sleeping in the Tesla, but I'll put all my wily charms into the effort and let you know how it goes. I've noticed that what little wind and road noise you do hear while driving primarily comes from behind you, and so I was disappointed to find out that our car didn't come with double pane rear windows. I had mistakenly thought they'd come to the US, but not so. Apparently, for now, they're just on the performance models coming out of China. Depending on the cost, though, I may upgrade to them if given the opportunity. Even though the car is so quiet now, that extra sound suppression would make it even better, and the improved insulation may also reduce battery drain in camping mode. If this happens, I will definitely make a video comparing before and after. Although Tesla's supercharger network is one of their greatest assets, I was a bit disappointed to discover that you can't get there from here still applies for some places. My wife wants to visit Bryce Canyon, followed by a trip to the Grand Canyon. And though I'm not sure I completely understand this screen, it doesn't look like we can do so within the Tesla supercharging ecosystem. But from the A Better Route Planner app on my phone, it appears we might be able to do so with a CCS adapter, as long as the one stall is operational. So I guess we wait a bit for that trip. Years ago, Tesla was roundly criticized for their soft paint, which as I understand it is a result of the cars being painted in California where the chemicals needed to harden the clear coat are severely constrained. I don't know if it's still considered an issue, but I had a chip on the hood after my first drive. More recently, my wife was closing the frunk while holding her keys and barely touched the hood, so she says, but it left a scratch. What's more concerning is that I took a paper towel and tried to rub out the scratch to see how deep it really was, and it left microscopic scratches in the clear coat that are clearly visible when light reflects off of it. You detailing experts are probably screaming at me right now that one should never use paper towels on a car surface. Live and learn, I guess, but still, you'd think the clear coat should be able to handle a paper towel. It's enough to make me consider PPF for the hood, but I'm reluctant because I don't know enough about how PPF deteriorates, and I doubt my ability to apply it since I can't even put on a phone screen protector without getting bubbles in it. I did buy a touch-up kit and will likely try it out and make a video of the process, but again, I'm nervous because making a mistake on the front would be immensely visible. Maybe the paint coming out of Giga Texas will be harder. In all fairness though, the blue paint is absolutely gorgeous. I was also a bit frustrated to find out that I couldn't easily figure out how to charge to 100% in the most effective manner. I've read that to maximize battery life, you don't want to leave your car at 100% any longer than necessary. In our first week, we decided to drive to Seattle from Spokane, and I thought it'd be nice to have the extra range that charging to 100% would give us. So I set the charge limit to 100% and scheduled the departure for the next morning, naively thinking the car would charge as late as possible in order to minimize the time the car would sit there at 100%. But nope. It charged immediately to 100% and left it that way all night long. I'm a software guy and am in awe of autopilot. I bought this car because it was a supercomputer on wheels and paid a significant chunk of change to get FSG just so I could help in some small way to bring this amazing life-saving tech to market by helping to test it. It's incredible tech and I admire Elon's vision and determination to bring it to market. But having said that, I'm a bit disappointed. It all boils down to expectations, really. Watching more than my share of FSD beta videos, I was expecting Autopilot to be a bit better. I'm not going to go into detail here as I'm making a video that clearly explains the different functions of Autopilot, Enhanced Autopilot, and FSD Beta. And the video will also explore how each function performs in the real world. But at a macro level, I think the best way to summarize its faults is to say it's slower to react than I expected. It's slow to see situations, 
slow to break, slow to realize danger has passed, and slow to accelerate. Keep in mind I don't have FSD beta yet and therefore don't have the AI stack. And so things will likely be better when I'm accepted into that program. Again, I'm not saying it's bad, it's amazing. It's just less than what I expected. I'll save the details for my autopilot video, but as an example, while on Navigate on Autopilot, I've been in many situations where, while entering the freeway, I've seen that it's going to need to speed up or slow down in order to merge smoothly. But it doesn't. Even though it shows the traffic on the visualization, it seems to wait until the last second to evaluate the merge, and then either aborts or performs some abrupt, sometimes dangerous, move in order to merge. Again, this is part of the process and why these features are in beta. I'm only disappointed because the videos online led me to think it would be better. There are also some logic issues that I don't understand. For example, while in Adaptive Cruise it does a great job of noticing speed limit changes, but more often than not it doesn't adjust the max speed that Adaptive Cruise follows, thereby forcing you to do it manually. Likewise, while I navigate on autopilot, it will tell you that it's going to change lanes only to freak out because a car is in the way. Why not check for traffic first and then only initiate the lane change process when things are clear? I do have a few concerns. There is a small whine we hear occasionally that I probably wouldn't have noticed except another YouTuber had mentioned he had the same thing. Although it's tied to RPM, it's not consistent, which makes me think it might not be normal. It's so small though that I don't want to set up a service appointment, so I'll probably just keep an ear on it for a while. Because of the slow to react aspect of autopilot, I'm also a bit concerned that it may be necessary to have the FSD Hardware 4 update in order to achieve full self-driving. If so, will the entire fleet of FSD users be upgraded? New cameras are coming as well, will those be upgraded too? This car is such an extension of yourself that I've been known to exclaim, oh, I guess I'm driving now. My family finds this concerning. Apparently, I need to better train my brain to listen for and react to the autopilot disengagement chime. I'm thinking of putting a video together that would identify and help folks get attuned to the various warnings and chimes the car makes. My biggest concern, however, is when will I get FSD beta? Apparently six weeks with a 98 safety score isn't enough. I also have a few things I'm curious about. Does creep mode affect efficiency, and if so, by how much? How much of a hit do you take at various temps and speeds if you roll down the front windows and turn off climate control? How much energy does camping mode take across various temps and wind speeds? Hopefully I'll have time to look into these, and if they're interesting, make videos of my findings. After a month of driving, these are the suggestions I would make to Tesla. If you agree with some of them, please like, subscribe, and recommend this video to others in the hope it can get enough traction to get Tesla's attention. If there are some you don't agree with, then let me know in the comments. And if I'm asking for something that's already in the car, then forgive me as I'm not known for being the brightest bulb on the tree. First and foremost, much to my surprise and dismay, I woke up a while back and found I'd gotten old. As such, I would really appreciate a display option that allowed me to change font and icon sizes. I love the auto blind spot camera view when you turn on the blinkers, but it would be easier to use if it was in the upper left of the display instead of the bottom left. It kind of surprises me that such a tech-savvy company as Tesla doesn't include a synthesized top-down view. It would be very helpful for parking as I often have trouble knowing where the front curb is, even with the ultrasonic warnings. Over a year and a half ago, Elon said that FSD would come with a vector space bird's eye view. Frankly, I'd rather have a synthesized photo version. Tesla should make a manual backdoor release that can easily be used during an emergency. We have a video showing how you can, for just a few bucks, make their existing manual backdoor release usable, but a usable manual release should be standard and built in. As it stands now, the 12 volt outlet is turned off when the car sleeps. It would be nice to have an option to keep it on all the time. So, for example, you could keep a fridge plugged in and not have to worry about it turning off and spoiling your food. 
it would be very helpful to have an exception charge option added in car and in the mobile app. You just tap the exception button and input the percentage of charge you desire and the time you want it to be charged by. Not only would this be helpful in setting up higher charging in preparation for a trip in a manner that would best treat your battery, but it would also be useful during a trip where you want to exceed your normal charging limit for the next leg. It'd be much easier to use than changing your charging limit and then having to change it back again later. There are so many messages that appear while driving, especially when using autopilot, that it might be nice if there was an option to have the messages read out loud as you learn to anticipate what they are. Even if the messages were larger for us older folks, sometimes the situation demands that you keep your eye on the road, not the screen. Having the car gently read the messages would be helpful. I'd also suggest expanding the following distance options from a max of 7 to a max of 10. While a setting of 7 on the freeway in rush hour may seem like a mile, it feels like you're tailgating when you're the only two cars on a long country road at night. How about allowing us to add the tire pressure screen to the shortcuts menu? While it's not a hard screen to get to, if you remember where it is, I feel many would like the ability to add it to the shortcut menu. Maybe for premium connectivity, they could integrate Wi-Fi calling into the phone function just in case your phone is unavailable. I couldn't figure out how to get Google Voice to place calls in the browser, but even if I could, it would be so much easier if Voice over IP was integrated. And finally, how about auto close on the front so my wife won't have to close it while holding her keys? Seriously though, it's irritating to get handprints on the hood every time you close it. That about wraps it up. Bottom line, after one month, I still love this car. Maybe even more than I did when I picked it up. While it may not be the perfect car, it blows away anything else I've seen. Thanks Elon and team for making driving so much fun. And thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you're so inclined. Until later, safe travels.